So the original game had a huge number of star systems that you could visit, but they weren't all generated in advance, were they? The computer created them as it went along to keep the, the size of the program down. That's right. We had a system that um, made them... They still all make sense, all the names are pronounceable and things like that, but it's a, what, what was called a procedural system. But I think the, the interesting thing with that is that um, different people mean different things by that now. It doesn't mean it's random. It's, it's a tool for an artist to help make things that have a bigger scope than they might otherwise do. If you think of um, a piece of fine art with an airbrush, where all the little dots of paint appear, even if it's an electronic airbrush, might be random, but it's still controlled by the artist. Mm. You're still getting those beautiful sweeping clouds or whatever. And so, in Elite Dangerous, do you use the same kind of technique? Do you generate, what is it, 160? Right. We have million stars, 400 whatever. billion stars. Oh, 400 billion stars, But right. 160,000 of those are taken from star catalogues. Even Hubble can't see this, the faintest kind of stars, the M-class stars, beyond about 50 light years. But what it can see is smoke. It looks like smoke. And we know there are stars there. We know roughly how many there are. But what we do is we then populate those with the right distribution in that space so that it makes sense, so that the night sky is right. Um, and you know, it's using those algorithms to do that distribution is, is what gives us our galaxy, and it is as accurate and as near to our galaxy as we can possibly make it, right down to each individual nebula. Like here, for example, that's Barnard's Loop. That's a real nebula, which where we are here in the galaxy, it's actually brighter because we're closer to it. That, that seems really important to you. That seems important that everything <laughs> is as accurate as possible. I mean, you've, you've mentioned Barnard's Loop several times. I so have. you're really proud of that. It's because you? that's where this is, it's near it. But there, all the other nebulae are in there as well. I, I, yes, I am <laughs> very proud of it. And it, it's, 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 like, it's because when something is real, when you, if you hear something is a true story in a film, that makes, makes the film more important to me. I mean, in another time, I suppose you would be out here, you know, in the future, you would be one of the people who wanted to go out here and. I do, I do hope so. When I was a teenager, or, or, or younger still, um, I remember the space programme in the late 60s, the early 70s, and I had expected we would be commuting to the moon, to Mars, there would be space stations all around. If you'd have told the, the sort of the 10-year-old me, no, 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 we still <laughs> we won't have gone back to the moon since then. You know, man hasn't landed on Mars and, yeah. and, and isn't in the immediate future. So I would have been devastated. Do? What did you do instead? You built this? Well, I'm, I'm hoping we can still go to Mars. I mean, there is talk of it. That would be brilliant. We yeah. need to be outward looking. We need to be looking to the future. You know, one of the things this game has taught me is just how vulnerable Earth is. We're doing the simulation. How many other stars are coming past our solar system in the next tens of thousands of years?